Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Omar Hamid, business developer in Online Petroleum Academy, OPA. I would like to thank you for being with us today in this webinar under the title of Lebanon Offshore Exploration First Timer Field. And on behalf of OPA, I would like to thank the societies for continuous collaboration with us. SPE BAU Student Chapter, SPE LAU Student Chapter, SPE LU Romeo Student Chapter, NDU Petroleum Engineering Society, Society of Engineering in Venetia University, and AAPG LU Student Chapter. I will start this session with a brief uh, presentation about OPA. So who are we? Our mission is to link between brilliant high-level experienced engineers and eager junior engineer students who want to learn and improve and increase their knowledge uh, in a comfortable way. OPA currently is in three countries. The headquarters is in Egypt and we're present in Lebanon and Sudan. And we're planning to spread all over the world very soon. Our services include courses which are provided online and offline in all the topics, drilling, reservoir, production, geology, and any other topic that is present in the oil and gas industry. And we already delivered 10 webinars during these three months, uh, where more than 1,200 total students attended from more than 20 countries. And we also provide intensive trainings on softwares like Petrol, Prosper, uh, uh, Aspen Hises or any other softwares and we will uh, also deliver uh, two software courses uh, in this month. Our second service is technical consulting and studies which is high profile experts in the oil and gas industry who are ready to help you optimize your project outcomes and tackle the technical problems you're facing in your company or department. Our third uh, service is the internships, where we provided the first internship in Egypt a few months ago. And our second internship will start this Monday on 6th of July. And it will be online due to the current circumstances and the lockdown in the whole world. Uh, this uh, internship will be uh, divided into three parts, OFM software, Prosper software, and projects. You can take the whole internship or you can take any part that you want, depending on your needs and willings. And we would like to announce that there will be two free tickets given to the attendees of today. Uh, one for Prosper course and one for the OFM course, and they will be chosen randomly after this session and they will be contacted uh, either today or tomorrow morning. Uh, and if you have anything or any questions, you can contact us on our email, opa at opacourses.com or on our uh, Instagram at OPA Lebanon. And before we start the, with Sara, I would like to tell you that this webinar will be 45 to 50 minutes and there will be a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And after the meeting, there will be a feedback form that will be sent uh, on the email. So please uh, make sure to fill it. And now I would like to welcome engineer Sara Bustani to start her session. All right, thank you, Amar, for the introduction. All right, can I share my screen now? All right, so um, hi, everyone. I would like to first um, thank you all for joining me for this webinar that's organized by um, it's truly a pleasure to be asked to do this and to share with you my personal um, offshore experience in the industry. Um, I was informed that most attendees are petroleum engineering students, so I hope that after this webinar, you'd be able to know more about life offshore, so just to get a first feel of what it is like to, to be offshore, so that in case you do get the chance to go offshore one day, you'd know what to expect. All right, so for um, the outline first, Wait, see if all right. 
So um, the webinar will be divided into three sections. Um, in the first section, I'll briefly discuss the sector in Lebanon, um, what happened in Block 4, since we're hearing a lot of contradictory information in this regard. And then basically we'll discuss um, the future of the sector. This will be in brief. And honestly, this is the only part that's going to be a little bit technical. Um, I'll move after that to talk about my personal experience from choosing petroleum engineering and attending college to joining Vantage Drilling and working offshore on Tungsten Exploded, which um, is the drill ship that I drove in Lebanon. And I'll end with a brief section that I was asked to include in the presentation um, that will involve some advice on how to stand out. So I hope um, you'll find it interesting and I hope it will help you guys out. So um, let's get started. So um, as we said, for the first section, we'll briefly discuss um, exploration uh, offshore Lebanon. So we'll go a little back in time to 2017, um, when the Lebanese government basically awarded blocks number four and nine in its first licensing round um, to the consortium uh, formed from Total, ENI, and Novatec, with the Total being the operator. So that happened in 2017. And Lebanon awarded these blocks under what we call an EPA agreement. So EPA stands for Exploration and Production Agreement. And it's basically an agreement between the state and three rights holders. And the aim of this agreement is to regulate the relationship um, between them during exploration and production activities that are taking place in specific locations, which in this case are for blocks four and nine. Now, if these companies or this consortium um, makes a discovery, then they'll have to study the commerciality of that discovery, okay? And if deemed commercial, then EPA obliges the right holders to submit a plan to be approved by the government so they can basically start with the next phase, which is the production phase. And that's usually around 20 to 25 years in duration, and it actually could be extended as well. Um, now, according to that, to that agreement, um, Total is obliged to drill two wells before the end of May 2021. One of these wells is in block four and the other well is in block nine. Now, we haven't drilled the well in block nine yet, um, but already drilled the well in block four, and that was a few months, uh, few months ago, and we'll briefly talk about it here. All right, so the well is basically drilled um, 20 kilometers away from Beirut shore, which takes um, about seven to eight minutes by helicopter. Um, usually water depth and TD, uh, TD basically is target depth. Um, the estimates basically during the study differ from what actually happens in reality because while you're drilling, you usually encounter things in just space situations that you haven't been considering. Um, so there's never a high accuracy when it comes um, to these values that are related to the depth uh, mentioned in, in drilling programs. So to give you the real values, um, water depth was around 1,540 meters and total TD reached was around 4,200 meters um, from the sea level and not from the sea floor because there has been a lot of confusion about this. Um, so the 4,200 meters um, depth includes the 1,540 meters of water. Um, the well profile is actually a deviated well and extra information, all of these information can also be found on the LPA website um, for those of you who are interested um, to check it out. Now, just to clarify the case with block four and without getting um, going into technicalities and just to say as is, because there has been a lot of inaccurate and misleading information, you know, in regards to what happened in block four um, offshore Lebanon. So as simple as it is, um, we were not able to find the reservoir that we were looking for. But that does not mean that the reservoir does not exist. Now, is this normal? Yes, of course it is at the end this is an exploration well, right? And the purpose of any exploration well is to locate where the potential reservoir could be, um, estimate the amount of gas that we're dealing with and determine what could be the type of gas that is present and that is available. Now it has happened many, many times before that um, companies drill five and six wells, exploration wells before encountering gas for the first time. And in all cases, the probability of, of finding commercial gas from the first exploration well is usually as low as 20 to 22 percent because after all um, deciding on the location of the well is merely based on interpretation of seismic data 
and seismic data and the interpretation of the seismic data is usually sub subjective. So it depends on how each person could actually interpret it. So each one can then interpret it in a different way. This is why it is highly subjective and there is um, somehow a very, very low probability of finding commercial gas from the first exploration well. Now on the bright side, the good thing that happened basically is the data that was collected about block four and the nearby area. You know, when we drill, now we have extra data, now we have extra information, and this would allow Total, if Total decides to drill again another well in block four, to basically drill the next well with um, higher certainty or a higher accuracy about where could um, the, the reservoir location basically be. Now, um, people are always interested to know about um, the future, of the industry in Lebanon and basically what is our role in ensuring um, the transparency of the sector. And, you know, I, I, I have to say, there is no doubt that the industry is developing and the industry has a future in Lebanon, well, at least on the short term. We have already drilled in block four a few months ago, we're already talking about drilling um, in block nine, and then we have the second licensing ground that's already open for the blocks um, in uh, green that you see in the presentation. It has been postponed many times, but it is still open until now. So we can basically safely say that for the upcoming years, we will be drilling, okay? We will be drilling many exploration wells offshore Lebanon. Um, from another side, it is no doubt uh, our responsibility to do the best we can to ensure that this sector takes its correct path. Um, not only basically on the level of society, but also on basically as part of the younger generation, because eventually this sector is for us um, in the future. And our part in it can be either direct, either indirect. Now, if we choose to directly be involved, basically if you guys choose to directly be involved and work in the field, know what the industry requires, know what the industry needs. I mean, yes, there is a need for engineers. There is always a need for petroleum engineers, but that's not it, right? For one or two petroleum engineers that we usually have working offshore, we need around 50 to 60 operators and technicians and mechanical engineers and electricians. So just know what is needed on the rig and attend relevant trainings to that if you are interested um, to go offshore um, when basically we're drilling in Lebanon, basically. And now, I am sure you've heard about the condition that was set by the government um, about basically having a specific number of workers on board uh, the rig, basically the Lebanese people. Right? The reason why we could not comply with that number was because of the lack of experience. So right now, we already know that we're going to drill wells in the future. So we have time to prepare until these wells. So I hope we do take advantage of that. Um, that was basically from the direct side of it. And the other route, basically, as we said, is an indirect one. Now, if we choose not to directly work in the field, let us at least have the basic knowledge of the technicalities from one side and the legality from another, just so we can basically audit and correct whatever happens in the sector. So that basically, if we notice something going the wrong way, we'll be able to know, so we'll know about it and we'll redirect it to its correct path. Um, I would like to end this uh, section by briefly talking about your role in stopping the spread of inaccurate information, because we're seeing this a lot on the news. And since it's the first well in Lebanon, and we are still relatively new um, in the industry. Now, anyone with an opinion about what happened without having credible information or backup to it is just simply going on media and, and people are actually starting to believe this. And this is causing the Lebanese people in general to be more confused. So um, there's a large part of you, a large portion, large number of you who are basically petroleum engineers, as I was told. So you do know if something someone said did not seem logical or did not make any sense. And even if you are not petroleum engineers, just make sure your source of information is credible before spreading anything else. And this is basically what we can do. This is how we can start um, with the change. All right, so that's it basically when it comes to um, Lebanon and the exploration in Lebanon. And now we'll move to the second section, which is basically about my personal experience. Um, so I'll start with a, a little bit about myself. All right, so first, basically, when I was um, considering my um, options for, for college majors, I was mainly focused on finding um, something I'm passionate about and something that challenges me at the same time. Um, I also um, always look for something different, something not so common. So if you want me not to do something, just tell me everyone does it, and that, not, that will work fine. It's no longer be interesting for me to do. 
Um, I've actually lived in Qatar for almost 14 years, and I think that had had an, an influence on my decision um, to choose petroleum engineering, you know, with the industry being well developed and well advanced there. Um, I did my research once I started thinking about going to petroleum engineering. So I did my research. I met a lot of professionals who shared with me their wonderful experiences in the field. And I simply felt like I could, I could relate to that. Um, I was even excited about going offshore more than anything else. And, and that's why I, by the way, I added these pictures on, on the slides. Um, so I love the idea of working on rigs. I love the idea of getting mud dirty and dealing with equipment that are 10 times my size. So yeah, I truly saw the beauty of working in the field and I knew that my passion would drive me all the way. Um, I graduated not so long ago, actually in 2019 with distinction from LAU, the Lebanese American University here in Lebanon with um, a degree in petroleum engineering and a minor in mathematics, having done three internships during summers, um, even though university only asked for one. Um, I also worked as an assistant for a petroleum engineering lecturer at LAU while I was studying. And um, during my last couple of years, I was very interested in, in getting to work in the petroleum engineering lab, you know, with the different equipment that were available there. Um, so during these, uh, during my last two years, I also worked as um, assistant for the petroleum lab supervisor at LAU. And that did provide me with um, an edge or extra knowledge on how to operate drilling simulators and, and core flooding equipment and many other equipment that were available um, in the lab. So this was definitely a plus for me. Okay, so I tried to take also as many online courses as possible and as my time would allow and was uh, truly interested in mastering Microsoft Excel because um, most companies you know, show a huge interest in this. Um, I also tried to learn new software, some of which are petroleum related, um, while others are just general ones like coding software, and Python, C++, and MATLAB, for example. And um, aside from that, I just tried to stay productive and stay involved in extracurricular activities as much as I can. Um, I joined many clubs, such as the LEU Petroleum Club and the SPE chapter at LEU, and um, I helped in organizing some of their events. Uh, I also served the Mall United Nations program, MUN. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's kind of like a, a conference that LEU organizes locally every year and also internationally in collaboration with um, UNA USA. So I served that program for four years, um, locally and internationally. And the past, uh, the last uh, three years were in leadership positions. Um, in 2019, in May 2019, I was um, assigned the secretary general position for the international MUN conference that was held in New York. Um, SG basically is the highest executive position that could be awarded to a college, uh, to any college student. So this is where I got the chance to um, lead uh, the organizing team for the conference and you know, give a speech in front of around 2,000, 2,500 attendees in the General Assembly Hall um, in the UN headquarters. And this is actually a picture of me during my speech. I don't know if it's clear enough for you to see. All right, um, at the time of my graduation, there had been a lot of about drilling block four in Lebanon and Total, um, the operator with the consortium for block four, um, had already asked Vantage Drilling um, to provide the rig. So Vantage Drilling is an oil and gas contractor company. A contractor is a company that owns rigs and rents them along with the equipment on them basically for operator companies. Uh, Vantage Drilling owns eight rigs, five of which are jackups and three drill ships. And Tungsten Explorer is one of the drill ships. It's basically the rig that drilled offshore Lebanon. Um, we need it for petroleum engineers. We need it um, a drill ship because we had a water depth that was basically 1,500 or more. So this is an ultra deep exploration. So that's why we needed a drill ship. And Tungsten Explorer was also available um, in the region. Basically was drilling in Egypt. So basically the total ended up choosing tungsten explorers to, to drill basically in Lebanon. So um, during that time, Venta Drilling published a post with the um, opening uh, it had for Lebanese nationals. And one of these openings, one of the positions um, was an operations engineer on a graduate scheme. Um, so they did not requir require someone with much experience. They wanted a specific academic record and someone with internships and someone who's done the extra work and gone the extra mile. 
um, I applied for the internship and I was uh, for the position, sorry. And I was told that around um, 200 people applied for it as well. And they ended up choosing um, eight people for the first interview that was totally based on the resumes. And then they narrowed the number down to four for the second interview, um, which was the technical interview. It was honestly not an, not an easy interview at all, especially the second one, because I had to review all the drilling courses I've taken before and I was not given much time. But I honestly prepared well for it as much as I could. And um, within a few days, I got an email saying that I got the job along with another engineer. And um, this is because they always end up having two people for the same position. Mainly, we go to the rig on what we call hitches. So um, we have 28 days on. Usually there are 28 days because four weeks. So we usually have 28 days on the rig and then we go rest for 28 days at home. So this is what we call one hitch going to the rig. And because basically the operations on the rig were always continuous, so we always had to have an operations engineer on the rig the whole time. So when I was on my 28 days off at home, there has to be someone replacing me on the rig and the other way around. So we basically replaced each other and this is what we call back to back. So they basically pick two petroleum engineers at the end so they can be basically each other's um, back to back. All right, so what is the job of an operations engineer on board the rig? And briefly, as brief as I can say it, an operations engineer monitors um, the ongoing operations just to make sure that they are in compliance um, with the standards that are set by the company. Um, we also work on budgets, on AFAs, on KPIs. We try to track the rig performance and just suggest ways to improve it. Um, aside from that, we are also one of the points of contact between the rig and the rig manager, um, who is the responsible person for the rig, but who usually works from an office onshore. All right, so to be able to go offshore, you need to have a medical certificate that proves you are fit to be working offshore. This is what we call an OGUK. Um, it's just a series of tests and medical examinations that you need to do. And then you have to have your safety trainings, and those include first um, what we call BOSIET. So BOSIET stands for Basic Offshore Safety Induction and Emergency Training. It is a three days course that is offered in many acad academies in different countries around the world. I actually did mine in Qatar. Um, the budget course is actually divided into sections. So um, the first section is a presentation about the safety induction in general. And the second one is basically firefighting, where you literally put fires out with fire, with fire extinguishers and just walk blindly in rooms full of smoke. It is fun. <laughs> and um, finally, the most exciting one, um, helicopter escape and sea survival. And I'll tell you a little bit about that one because I'm sure you, it'll excite you as well. All right, so basically what happens is a simulation of, of the possible scenarios of what could occur if the helicopter that was taking you from the base and from the shore to, to the lake falls into the water. And this is done in a pool that's like seven to eight meters deep and a small helicopter with four seats and four windows. So the helicopter basically will be dropped from a certain height with four students on the seats with the seat belts on and the windows closed and you just simply have to get yourself out of there. Um, in one of the scenarios, which is the worst case, honestly, the, the helicopter just capsizes. So it, it's returned. It turns 180 degrees. So you have to hold your breath and just have to wait until it's stable and you're completely upside down. And then you just have to locate the window, push the window out, get your seat belt off and just go out of the water as soon as you can. It is not easy, but it's super fun. It's super exciting. And it's also um, safe. Don't worry. There are actually swimmers and divers just making sure you can get yourself um, out of there before you run out of breath. All right. Um, aside from that, aside from these trainings, you might be asked to attend H2S trainings as well um, in case the location where the rig is drilling um, is in an H2S environment. And this is basically the yellow thing that you see in the uh, now in the slide, this is what you'll have to know how to read and how to op operate. It's just an H2S device. Um, basically, also you might be asked to go for a CAEBS training. CAEBS stands for Compressed Air Emergency Breathing System. Uh, that basically will depend on the life jackets that are being used um, in the helicopter. All right, so after, going, um, after undergoing the needed trainings and obtaining the required certificates, um, I was sent along with my back-to-back -to, -back to the drill ship to tungsten exploded while it was still in Egypt before it sailed um, to Lebanon 
uh, that was only for a couple of days just to get myself familiar with the rig, with the location of everything, you know, with the equipment and kind of get to know the people who might be working there as well. And of course, the most important thing to get my PPE. So um, safety is a very important thing for all contractors and Vantage drilling really takes it seriously. All personnel who are working outside the accommodation were to be fully equipped with the correct PPE before leaving that building. There is a building on the rig um, only for accommodation and we'll talk about that in a bit. And you cannot go outside the building without having your full PPE on. Um, PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment, and that's basically the equipment designed um, to protect the body from injury and from infection. And the basic ones on, on basic terms, basic PPE would include um, long sleeve coveralls, glasses, a hard hat, safety boots, um, gloves, um, and earplugs as well. Now, funny story here, I am actually a little tiny in size. Um, so it was kind of difficult for me to find coveralls my size. You know, the smallest ones they had were actually super huge. And some ended up just suggesting that I get mine from Toys R Us because there's no way I'm getting, I'm finding coveralls my size. So yeah, even the boots, the boot size, I had to pre-order mine so they can custom make them before I arrived there. So if you are tiny inside as well, um, that's going to be a hassle for you, but in a funny way, don't worry. That's just a heads up. Anyways, all right, moving on from here. So when the rig arrived to block four, I joined it for my first hitch. So it arrived to Lebanon and to block four in Lebanon. I joined it for my first hitch. And then when my hitch was over, I came back home for a couple of days, four days basically. Um, then was sent again with uh, some of the crew members to a hotel for a 20 days quarantine or an observation period because you know the situation and, and COVID-19. I actually went back to the rig after that for my second pitch where I stayed for 32 consecutive days until the P&A of the well, the plug and abandonment of the well. Um, now I'm sure you're interested to hear all about life offshore and what it's like. Um, so I'll walk you through it from the moment I arrived on the rig to the moment I left the rig. So upon arrival by helicopter, um, I was guided along with the other newcomers to a lounge where we had to attend um, safety induction. The safety induction basically is a presentation that elaborates on some of the rules and the procedures that you need to abide by. Um, basically, you also get informed about your work schedule. Since operations on the rig are continuous, so we work day and night, there has to always, um, we have to have two people as well with the same job working different shifts for most of the positions. So we have someone working from say 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then another person would come to replace him for 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So they'd have opposite shifts. Now, all shifts are 12 hours and either six to six or 12 to 12, depending on what the role is. Um, after that, we were basically taken on a small tour around the um, accommodation just to get to know where everything is. Um, in the accommodation building, some floors have offices while others are just rooms. And um, usually two crew members are assigned in, in, each, in each room but they're always on opposite shifts. So they're never really together at the same time in the room. And that's actually a good thing because it kind of provides you with some sort of privacy at least. And now you're, not, you're also not allowed to go into the room during your work shift, just to allow your roommate to have the room for himself for his 12 hours off shift. Um, the rooms look pretty much to the pictures, to be honest. Um, these pictures, by the way, are not taken from tungsten. Um, I found them online and they actually look pretty similar to what how things are on tungsten, so that's why I added them here. So as you can see, the rooms are actually nice. Um, most of them come with a window and a view as well. Um, of course, a view to the sea because um, there's nothing else to see that rhymes. All right, um, the rooms do have TVs as well, so um, you can you have TVs, you can watch movies sometimes uh, during your time off, and there is Wi-Fi on the rig. I know you care to know about that as well. Um, there's a mess room that looks um, something like the picture on the bottom left uh, in the presentation where basically food is served um, in two hours windows um, for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. And um, there's also a cafeteria with coffee, tea, small snacks that's basically open all the time. Uh, the rig also has gyms, cardio and lifting. I was going to say that um, this in this interest guys, but I'm then thought that this is basically the kind of uh, gender labeling ideas that we need to start getting rid of because let's be honest, some girls um, do enjoy the gym too. And personally, I was a regular too. Um, basically, I work day shift, 6 a.m. to 6 
p.m. But everyone had to attend a pre-job safety meeting at 5.30 a.m. So um, the aim of the meeting was to inform all crew members uh, about the ongoing operations for the day and the potential hazards that uh, are related to them. Because as I said, safety is a very important thing um, for all contractors and for Vantage as well. Um, my position did not require anyone to work the night shift. So we did not have any operations engineer um, working during the night. So it was only my day shift, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But I do, I usually basically stay more and sometimes wake up in the middle of the night for work, um, depending on the ongoing operation. So say if we were assembling a BHA or we were tagging cement at 1 a.m., then I was up for that regardless of whether that was during my shift or not. All right, um, lastly, I'll talk about my experience from another aspect, uh, mainly from being the only woman on board Tungsten Explorer, uh, basically because I usually get asked about that a lot. And I hope that that's motivated the ladies listening right here. And that's me on the rig, by the way, in the picture on the right. All right, so basically living offshore, um, living offshore by itself is something completely different. And it's actually beyond what you can imagine. It is tough, no doubt, but it's fun and rewarding at the same time. And it's definitely challenging and even more challenging when you're a woman and when the thing is not so common yet. And more challenging than that if you are the only woman on the rig. Um, being the only girl among um, 180 and sometimes 190 other men, um, I won't deny there were some judgments. You know, not everyone accepted the idea of having a woman on board and that's okay. Um, it's also usually harder to try to build relationships um, with the crew um, of just a group of guys if you're a woman, no doubt about that. Uh, but um, I think what made it harder even more was um, basically being in the Middle East because in this region, we are still stuck in the idea of gender-based work environments and gender-based positions, which means that we basically label positions to be suitable um, only for either a man um, or a woman. And now um, regardless, what happened basically was that I had a mindset before I went, um, and that helped a lot, uh, basically just refused to see myself differently um, so that others won't be able to do so, to do so either. It actually all starts um, within. I just did not give any importance to negative comments and just focused on my work and, and worked on my own self-development. And it actually did not take too long for me to realize that um, if I worked hard and did well and did my best uh, in, within what I was supposed to do and within my responsibilities, then my gender was definitely not a hindrance. Well, at least it was not for me. And at the same time, I cannot deny that there were a lot of people who were extremely supportive, extremely kind and trying to be helpful and just, you know, staying out of your way just for you to feel comfortable. And that made everything much better, you know, and the environment in general was, was much comfortable as well. Um, it's also very nice um, to get to know people from different countries, you know, having different backgrounds, um, learning more about their different cultures. Um, on the rig, we had crew members from the US, some were from UK, from Croatia, Canada, India. Um, we had people from South Africa, from Egypt, of course, from Lebanon and some other countries as well. Um, so just the work in a diverse environment, uh, this, this diversity of people coming from different areas is actually a nice thing by itself. So it was definitely a nice experience. Now, usually when um, I say gender-based environment, work environment and positions, I'm usually asked if I really do believe that this should not exist or that if I really do believe that this does not exist. And my answer to this had always been the same. Um, we cannot deny that there are some positions that are more suitable to men than women. But that does not mean that women cannot occupy them if they wish to do so, you know, especially with technologies now making things um, much easier. Um, I've actually read about women working as roustabouts and floormen, which are, by the way, two positions that require some sort of physical effort. And others basically work as assistant drillers and drillers, um, OIM, captain, DPO, dynamic positioning officer. So, yes, while there might be positions that uh, are more suitable to men, women can still do the if they decide to do so. Being stuck with this idea of, of gender-based positions in most of our societies here in the Middle East is definitely keeping us back. Because um, let's be honest, having women working offshore um, on rigs is becoming somehow of a common thing in other areas around the world. So it's not so uncommon in the US, it's not so uncommon in the North Sea. And honestly, Tungsten exploded, which was uh, built in Korea, in South Korea in, in 2013, 
is equipped to have a woman on board because they actually had a female changing room as well. So the idea is not so common, but it's just us in the Middle East, in these regions, that we are still find be far behind in this regard. And I honestly added these pictures on, on the slide on purpose. And if you, if you look at the one on the right, um, this was in 1983. And this woman was the only woman on board. She was working as a rustabout, um, basically, um, basically, as I said, which is some sort of a physical type of, of work. And she was the only one, 1983. So you guys tell me how far behind are we in this regard? So basically the idea that the rig is not suitable for a girl um, does not support girls in this area and, and basically sets barriers in front of women who are interested in uh, joining the industry or just STEM fields in general. And that is a problem we face mainly in our regions here. But the bigger problem I think is that women themselves sometimes do not put much um, effort in trying to remove these barriers. And this is mostly linked to how women perceive themselves within their societies. Um, that is no doubt a perception of lack of confidence. Um, I read once about a Harvard business study, it's actually in the slide. Um, basically it showed that while men apply to job positions when they only comply 50 to 60% with the requirements, um, women wait until they completely fulfill all of the requirements. And this is a basic issue. This is basically a lack of self-confidence is not allowing us to apply for all positions that we feel that could be possible for us to do. So, and women actually struggle seeing themselves as leaders or working in, in such fields. So from this, we can actually conclude that the answer definitely lies in, in confidence building before anything else. And basically, honestly, the absence of female role models as well did not help. <laughs> but there has to be someone who does it basically. That we have to have someone who starts with it, who does it regardless of the social barriers, um, regardless of the lack of support from the, from the society. Um, you know, someone who takes that first step so we can have role models for the future. And I hope this um, starts with us now. Um, so for all the girls who are listening here, um, not just the girls, the guys as well, but mainly girls because they are facing the barriers in this regard. Um, for all the girls who are passionate about working offshore and just being part of the field, just or being involved in any kind of STEM work in any kind of STEM field, um, know that there are no limits to what you can accomplish. And know that you are not limited to a particular industry um, simply based on your gender. Um, you are capable, so do not let anyone define what you want uh, or what you should do. Um, this is your career path. Um, so just choose not to give importance to all the negative and destructive comments that you might hear from people who simply just do not understand your passion and drive. You know, remember that you do not have to have everyone's understanding and everyone's approval, and you definitely do not need to explain yourself. You know, it has to start with us. Um, women have to see themselves. We have to start seeing ourselves um, differently so we can um, so we'll be able to change the mentality of the whole society. And this is the only way around this. Um, notice basically the hashtag in the, in the slide. By the way, this is a hashtag that a friend of mine and I were trying to spread right now because it is about time that girls, you know, get role models in STEM in general. All right, so that's it basically about my experience and trying to empower women as well to join the field if interested. Um, and now we move for the final section. Well, I'll give you guys some advice that I think, or at least I hope would be able to help you out. So, okay, let's do it. Um, number one, make it your passion, simply because if what you study or what you do is something you're passionate about, it's just much easier to get, with, to get good grades and it's just much, much easier to be able to stay involved. And that will show, trust me, it will make you stand out and that's much more valuable than a 4.0 4 GPA. Um, I read this somewhere and I thought I should share it with you um, because I simply just liked how, how it was written. Um, there is beauty in the oil and gas industry, but nobody sees it except those who are passionate about it. And this does not only apply to the petroleum industry. Just make sure you feel like you belong in your majors and that you're passionate about them because that will drive your success and your thirst for knowing more. All right, number two, be conscious with your time. So use your time wisely, you know, try to do something that makes you stand out and work on becoming a better version of yourself. Um, for example, don't just learn in classes, try becoming more knowledgeable about areas that interest you uh, by taking online courses. And these could be technical ones, like courses related to drilling operations, for example, um, or more general ones like um, Excel courses or coding or project management. 
Um, online webinars are also a new trend right now. And um, similar to online courses, speakers would share information, just exchange knowledge, um, however, in a more interactive way, which can make it more interesting. So keep checking for online webinars. You can find plenty every day. And you can find webinars every week on OPA as well. Um, now, no matter what you do, basically, just do not waste time. Stay, product stay productive as much as you can and stay busy. And finally, make sure you just stay involved. You know, keep yourself updated with the latest information about your field and what affects it. And just keep checking the news and updates. In other words, um, do not leave yourself uh, in the dark, especially right now with COVID-19 and most of us having to stay at home for the lockdown. All right, three, apply, apply, apply. So just um, keep applying. The title says it all. Um, you will get tracked, yes, that's sure. But um, basically, according to some surveys, um, a UK survey exactly, basically showed that it takes, on average, 27 applications to be able to land one interview. So you are on track. Just keep going and do not give up there. You know, the right opportunity will come along, no doubt. Um, one more thing to add here. Uh, do not limit your applications to simply just job positions, you know, especially if you are fresh graduates. Um, internships are very much needed and they constitute a requirement for all companies before considering hiring someone. And they're actually much easier to get um, than just landing a full time job uh, directly after graduation. Um, now, even if you did one internship before, you can always do more. Just don't spend your summers um, relaxing on the beach the whole time. Yes, take a month off, but just try to get internships as well this will help you out the more internships you do the better for you basically it is because you'll be preparing yourself for work and just enhancing your resumes as well um so look for those and try to improve as much as you can your soft skills and technical knowledge um opa actually offers internships uh, for students every year and this year they're basically combining petroleum related projects with um, petroleum softwares and trust me you'll need the softwares as well so make sure you check it out if interested all right, now we, when we talk about applying, we also talk about resumes because um, resumes is usually the first impression. So spend time working on your resumes, updating resumes, just make sure that they are as detailed as they should be. Um, your resumes should look like something, um, should look something like the ones you see, uh, the one you see in the presentation right now. And it should basically include, I'll be brief in this, um, your name, the correct um, detailed and the correct and detailed contact information, um, your title, a brief description about your experience and what you're basically looking for in that job. Um, for students and recent grads, the first section should be your education since that's your biggest accomplishment. And that's basically your degree, um, university, location, and possibly your GPA. Um, the work experience section um, should include internships, all part-time jobs that you've been involved in as well. And make sure you give detailed bullet points about your responsibilities within each position. Um, also, if you've done volunteer work, make sure, you, make sure you include those in your resume as well. Um, now, the skills section should include both soft and technical skills. Do not just focus on one of the two. Um, you can either um, just have them in one section or split them up into two sections um, as shown in this resume. Um, also, add important projects that you've worked on while you were in college or during in your internship and that you think are somehow relevant um, to, the, um, to the work or the job or the internship that you're actually applying for. Um, languages are also important. Make sure you add those along with the level of competency in each of those. And one last point, just try to restrict your resume to be one page, one page long and not more. Usually um, HR tend to avoid or just lose interest um, while reading a resume that's like more than a page, especially for entry job levels, for entry level jobs, sorry. Um, so just try to keep it one page. All right, number four, work your network. Um, yes, you should definitely be applying online on companies' websites, but do not just leave it at that. You know, it is much harder for you to stand out online. Um, so you need to try to get beyond that. And this is when you need to work your network. Um, so call people, call companies, and send emails if you have contacts. Just do not get stuck with only online applications. And this is why it's very important before that to have a network that's well built. So we need to work before that on building your network. 
um, maybe this is like social media is now the preferred way preferred way for all organizations to find new talent. You know, in fact, around 92% um, of, of companies use social media to find uh, job candidates, and 87% of these um, recruiters actually specifically use LinkedIn to search for candidates. So that's why I think the best way to connect and build a network, in my opinion at least, and as um, the, the statistics showed, um, it's basically through LinkedIn. It's just direct, it's professional, and simply just used worldwide by everyone. So if you do not have an account, make sure you create one right away. And if you already do, make sure yours is updated and you're actually active on it as well. All right, so briefly regarding LinkedIn profiles, um, you need to make sure it includes the, for the following. Um, first, um, a professional picture, and it should be a recent one as well. Um, include a brief but yet a clear title about your current work position and, and company. It should definitely not be two to three sentences long, you know, just keep it concise, a few words related to your biggest accomplishments. Do not list all your previous experiences and all previous positions. Um, so it can simply be like engineering student at X university. Now, if you've done something uh, more impressive, say for example, um, you were an intern at an important company or um, you're president of an SPE chapter in a university, um, then you can mention that thing in your title. Um, the sample uh, profile in the slide is actually a good representation of a very impressive uh, profile. All right, now also include a summary section, okay? Ideally, this section should include a one or two small paragraphs, um, no more than 250 words, um, just resuming your work experience and project. Uh, in the experience section, you know, do not just mention the title and the company, you know, similar to CVs, um, elaborate on your responsibilities, on the duties, and what you did while you were working um, with the company. Uh, as an example, I've included a section from my own LinkedIn profile on the right, top right, and see how I detailed on my responsibilities with my current position um, with Vantage Drilling. All right, and the skills section, um, add both soft and technical skills, and do not leave the accomplishment section empty. You know, just include the languages that you know, um, the projects that you've worked on, if any um, online courses, if you've taken some test scores can also be good to include, especially if there are impressive ones um, for some interesting um, tests like SATs or IELTS or TOEFL, for example. And finally, just make sure you follow pages uh, of companies and people um, that, um, are related to your fields and that could be of interest to you as well. All right, number five, take every opportunity you get. Um, yeah, sometimes it might not be exactly what you were looking for or what you wanted, but just take it anyway. I really do believe that there's always something to learn um, from everything that we do. Um, and besides, you don't really know what a specific opportunity will bring for you down the road. So it could be part in getting you a job directly or indirectly and if not basically it could be something to add for your resume or or something to gain a skill from as well so it's for your benefit anyway and um, do not turn down these opportunities and uh, as students by the way take advantage of the fact that um, there's a lot of things that are usually asked uh, from students especially in universities you know in particular um, working with research papers or, or working um, on specific papers helping professors and lecturers um, so do get involved in that if you get the chance and if you can, and add it to your resumes, of course. Um, you can also always go job shadowing if you do get the chance to do so. And do not forget about the internships as we discussed. All right, before the last one, number six, um, go the extra mile. So do not wait on companies and people to find you and do not wait on things just to come your way. You know, go out and work yourself and seek out your own opportunities. Um, make sure you're always one step beyond what is expected of you or what is asked of you. And don't just go after 4.0. I understand it's important, but there are things that are much more important than that, trust me. Um, for example, if your university asks for one internship, make sure you do more than one if you get the chance to do so. Um, work on enhancing your soft, your soft skills. You know, be good at communicating, at, at presenting, at writing. These will be um, an added value and will give you an edge um, later on in your career. Uh, other than that, work on improving your software skills. You know, software knowledge is very important for, for all engineering majors. Um, for petroleum engineers, you do take some software courses in college, I am sure, but um, those are usually limited. You know, um, look for online courses, look for trainings in academies that can teach petroleum software, and that will help you out because you will need these courses, you will need these softwares as well. 
Um, and that will definitely give you an edge, by the way, in landing a job or securing an internship. Uh, OPA actually offers trainings, actually offering trainings right now on some petroleum softwares, uh, mainly Prosper and um, OFM, so oil field, man oil field manager. And I'll personally be enrolling in the OIF, OIF, OFM course, um, and that will be useful for my work as well. And one thing to add here, and just to stress on the importance of, of this and of being involved in general, um, both my back-to-back -back and I are LEU grads, and we actually both have similar resumes. So we both did three internships. Um, we both registered in online courses and trainings for software. Um, we both were involved in extracurricular activities um, in MUN, in Petroleum Club, in SPE chapter. And I think basically choosing both of us for the position from all the other applicants is enough proof of how important it is, you know, to go the extra mile. Um, one last thing. Always remember that there is no need to be number one in everything. You know, you just need to be unique. You just need to stand out in your in your own way. So we have a lot of people who might end up getting 4.0s once once they graduate. But the important thing that will distinguish you is what you do above that, what you do outside university. So make sure you focus on that as well. Give importance to your to your to your courses, of course, and to your grades, but do not give it everything. Do not just focus on it by itself. The 4.0 is not the only thing that can land you a job. All right, the last one, um, keep it positive, mainly because, yeah, it's natural to feel um, job search frustrations when things aren't going as planned, you know, but maintaining a positive outlook can, can help you become more resilient and can motivate you, you know, to continue with your search. Um, also, your positive attitude will come across during interviews if you get the chance to do so and during networking opportunities as well. And this would actually increase um, your chances of making a stronger first impression. So always stay positive, always stay optimistic. And that's it from my side. Thank you guys for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.